Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. It's just for one day of Bowie celebration. This is an incredible event that Mike Garson has put together. I have an artist up next who's somebody that I've been a huge fan of since their very first single when I bought it on an import. The great bass player from Duran Duran, John Taylor, and they did an amazing cover of Five Years from the Ziggy Stardust album. Let's take a listen to part of that now. The way that you talk, I kiss you, you're John, good to see you. Hey, Matt. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. You know, it's amazing. I think back about when I found the Planet Earth single in a record store. Mm. When I was a kid, and I went, that looks really cool. That looks interesting. And then Careless Memories after that, and Girls on Film, and you yeah. know, the, all the singles from that first record, and couldn't wait for the first album to come out. And, and I was at the show June 26th or 23rd in New Jersey. It's a place called the Meadowbrook Ballroom in Cedar Grove, the first show of the Rio tour. Oh. With B movie opening up, remember those nice. guys, like yes. Nowhere Girl and uh, yes. all that. And you guys were phenomenal. Oh, thanks. The first thing I remembered, and, and I and I think back about it, is watching you and Roger that rhythm section just kick in and the groove, and it's just so in pocket, you know. Yeah. And I love that. I yeah. Mean, it, it blows me away when I think back that was about very it. important to us. And uh, you know, we we were both punk rockers. We both started playing, you know, in in sort of punk rock groups, but when we started playing together we 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 really wanted to create a rhythm have a rhythm section that had a pocket i mean in punk rock nobody talked about pocket there was yeah. no you know it wasn't about being tight everybody just went went for it you know yeah uh, i mean the bowie rhythm section i mean particularly the dennis davis george murray rhythm section were a massive uh, inspiration to us i mean song like stay for yeah instance. i mean that kind of a groove we, we that's how we learned to play really was by was by sort of you know practicing pockets like that one you yeah know, where where the kick drum bass drum and the, and the bass were really really tight and and we'd get to a fill like going from like a verse to a chorus and we would practice it and practice it and practice it you know yeah. until we got it right you know and uh you know and it really helped it well it made us made us who we who we became yeah which is amazing and then of course you know meeting andy and uh, and Simon yeah. and Nick and just uh, I mean it was what, what an incredible uh, journey it is and you know I love the documentary too by the way it was Thank so you. good yeah. to see it but it was also as a fan it was so great when the deluxe editions of the first two albums came out with mm. the self titled and the Rio well the first self titled right? right and you, you heard demos of things like is there anyone out there or right. or the early versions yeah. it was just cool to see how you guys developed yeah tell me about that that jump you know going from you know, working and doing the demos to working with people like Colin Thurston or yeah. you know, at that period of time. Your well, producer. you know, we, you know, we really didn't have a lot of experience and, you know, in, in studios, I think maybe, you know, we, we paid for a couple of, you know, afternoons in sort of four track demo studios, but along the way we did meet a couple of people that really, really upped our game. One guy was Bob Lamb yeah. who, who had been, the drummer in a, in a in a band. I mean, he'd been the drummer in the Steve Gibbons band, who had been, you know, who'd gone to America and 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 toured with the Who. So consequently, he had flight cases. I mean, we'd never seen a flight case. Yeah. And Bob had produced UB40 in his yeah. in his home studio, and that was a hit. It was a big hit. So Bob kind of had the touch, and Bob was like the first guy who really took us seriously, and we did. The first couple of demo sessions we did with him, that's the genesis of the Duran Duran sound. Um, Colin Thurston, you mentioned. I mean, Colin, yeah. we were put into the studio. Colin, we met through Dave Ambrose at EMI. And uh, Colin, again, Bowie, you know, Colin had been on the uh, Hansa sessions. You know, he'd yeah. worked on uh, Lust for Life. Yeah. And uh, I think he was Tony Visconti's assistant, I think. Yeah. So, you know, that was like the ultimate, yeah. you know. And, and so, you know, because of that, Colin was getting to do Magazine, The Human League, Bow yeah. Wow Wow, yeah. you know, all these bands. So we were introduced to him and we went into the studio with him and he made us sound like, wow, you know, yeah. on steroids. I mean, he raised everybody's game. And that's what you that's what you really want from a producer because everybody, I mean, every song on that first album we, we had written that, that we'd been playing live 
but when when we recorded those songs and 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 they were mixed they they sounded like like nothing we'd done before they and then you have to live up to the recordings when you go out on stage <laughs> yeah. yeah and you did i yeah, mean that's yeah what, yeah yeah what i said did it get better as you as you played because by the time i got to see you the first time it was that opening show yeah. the rio tour and you were you guys were great i mean it, you, it was a it was a tight show yeah and powerful it felt you felt like you were just so at home as a five piece there when you guys were playing live on stage it, it just it really translated you well know? I, can't, I can't even imagine what it's like right now but i mean if you're a, if you're a musician or an artist a band yeah. you know and you're a songwriter all you really want to do is play yeah. you just want to get out and work yeah. you know you want to see how your material impacts on people tempos you know how one song works against another and you know that was the the opportunity really of of getting a record deal you know getting an agent and uh, getting to go to america you know and doing show after show after show after show and and that's where you that's the testing ground yeah. you know and then you come back to england and then you've got to write new songs and you go back into the studio and then it, for us it was rio that was the second album and you know there was a there was a big difference between the level of uh, you know finesse and professionalism on on that second album uh, to the first album and you know that was just because we we'd all been professional musicians for a year yeah you know yeah and they were great songs too i mean you yeah. had more, you had another set of really great songs when you i mean yeah i mean you had some singles out of between you well there's a version of my own way yeah. that was different than the yeah. one that ended up yeah. on the album yeah. but yeah. i mean the record was great start yeah. to finish yeah. and those crazy i remember it was a the trip you guys took to sri lanka to do the hungry like the wolf mm -hmm. video yeah and then when nick and simon came to new york um I was there waiting at EMI America's offices or or Harvest, I guess was part of that, but it was right. the next um and I was college radio DJ, but they had invited me up because I love the band to do an interview. Oh, wow. And the guys were still sunburned from that trip. Huh? And there was like a you know, one of those industrial video players, right. and we watched the Hunger Like the Wolf video uh, together in this yeah, room yeah. with just like stools, it was a spar like sparse room, and it was something I'll never forget. It yeah. was really cool. But we yeah. We talked about a lot of music and then mm. seeing the shows and then following you doing so many great things over the years, John. It's just, I've loved the band. Thanks. And I want to say, let's go back to the fact that on Careless Memories on the 12-inch, mm. which was the second single, you guys covered Fame. Yeah. Well, we got quite a, you know, over the years, we've covered a lot of David Bowie's songs. Like Starman, know. right? Space Oddity. Yeah, let's we did, Dance. I mean, Suffragette City was an encore that we would play very early on. Did you do Diamond Dogs too, right? We did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did Fun Time. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, Fame. Uh, yeah, Starman. I mean, you know, David's the place that he's the artist that we all we all meet at. Yeah. You know, we all all of us bring different influences um, to the table. But that's you know, you know, in terms of like the pie chart or whatever it is, yeah. David's music is where we all where we all meet, and that's why this was such a such a gift such an opportunity for us um to be a part of this yeah uh, to be a part of this project to to record five years which was mike's suggestion where we yeah. were all like oh my god i mean you know i don't know that we would have dared <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know to to um make that suggestion but when mike made it we were like yes we would love to love to play that song yeah and i think that's amazing i mean you look back and your history with David Bowie is really interesting too. But for you personally, I mean, I know that Nick has said before how truly he felt Bowie was his biggest influence as an artist. And I think the whole band meets there mm. in some degree, right? Mm. Um, tell me about the first time you heard David Bowie. When first you time discovered I heard him. him. Yeah, when you were young. Uh, I think the first time I heard him, I was, I, I, you know, my cousin was like my big brother. He was five years older than me and he had quite an extensive record collection. And I was with him at his at his friend's house and they were listening to hunky dory yeah and i think that was the first time i mean other than hearing space oddity obviously because it was a number one song but it was almost like a it was almost like a novelty song like a one-off yeah yeah i didn't dig into it i didn't look behind you know the artist's name and I, I was still only 10 at that time yeah but when hunky dory came out i noticed that and um and then you know the oft uh talked about top of the pops. on top of the pops that <laughs> star was, man right that was just around the corner and um where were you at when you watched that that night? well i was at home you know watching top of the pops in uh 
in in Britain in the 70s was a family was a family occasion. You know? Yeah. And I would sit there with my parents and everybody would comment on what they, you know, yeah. on what they were looking at. And there was something for everyone. Um, but and a lot's been said about the look of David and the spiders. But for me, the, it was the sound. It was the music that got me. And the, I mean, I became a big fan of Mick Ronson's. Actually. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think because I was a bit of an elitist and, um, you know, everybody liked David. So I was going to like Mick. Yeah. And that's actually how Nick, Nick and I bonded. We, we were like the only two kids in our neighborhood that, that had like, you know, when, when Mick had put out Slaughter on 10th Avenue yeah. and we were wearing like the red and white sailor shirts. And yeah. Nick, you know, Nick, Nick and I bonded over, over being fans of Mick's. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, on Ziggy Stardust particularly, uh, you know, Mick is just there. He is the phantom menace he in is. the background. And he just brings, he brings such an emotional weight. I mean, not that five years needs any emotional weight, but just in terms of his... Um, string arrangements particularly yeah and uh, i mean we were talking to mike about the piano and, and actually it's it's mick playing piano on on the original five years i mean one of the really exciting things about this this song that we, we, we did tonight was to perform the song with with mike playing piano yeah and i think i think you know if you're a fan of david's as we are you're going to really dig that yeah because it's really interesting hearing you know, the guy that we love from Prettiest Star and Time and, and yeah. all, of, all the things yeah. on the Latin scene when he yeah. really first joined. Yeah. yeah, but had Mike been a part of... Of the Ziggy Sessions. Yeah, what right. would it have sounded like? Yeah, exactly, yeah. which is so great. Yeah. I, I think that's really cool. So that was the thing for you. So so the Ziggy album came out. I love the fact that you talk about loving Mick Ronson too because there were really great things on that record. You know, like on Bowie wrote, yeah. Oh, yeah. Grown Up and I'm Fine, oh, which no, was a, a Bowie song. It's a masterpiece. And Only After Dark, which was just such a rocking, I mean, there's music no, is lethal. It, 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 yeah. it's, it's a non, you know, it's a, it's one of the, it's the masterpiece. It's, it's the one that got away. And I always say it's the companion volume to Ziggy Stardust, really. I think, yeah. You know, and David's fingerprints are all over it. You know? Yeah, they really so are. So there's a lot of David on it. But um, but Mick wasn't um, he wasn't the front man. He didn't really that wasn't really his thing, was it? Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, but that was an amazing and, and it's extraordinary, really, when you consider what a short time it was that they that they worked together. But yeah, the, what they did together was wow. incredible. Yeah. yeah, just and then going from Aladdin saying to pinups and all that. This record sounds so great. Amazing to do that tribute to the British invasion. All, yeah. the, all those yeah. songs yeah. that were on yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's some of the songs they <laughs> they even uh, they, some of them they almost better than the originals. Yeah, not all of them, but I mean, but they. But it was such a great record. It was powerful. But it didn't yeah. get. I mean, it was kind of panned when it came out. You know, um, I mean, but I, I think the arrangements on that were just, and and that was Mike and Mick and. Ainsley Dunbar. I mean, that yeah. was a fierce rhythm section on that record. It really was. David was singing his ass off, and he was, you know. But again, you know, I mean, he'd just come off the back of it. I mean, the the, the sort of the Ziggy Aladdin Sane tour just went on, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, you know, it did it just, absolutely. It was just like they came to America three times, I yeah. think, and you know. And he was definitely exhausted at that yeah. point, and ready for a change up. And sadly, that surprised the band that one night, of course, at the Hammersmith Odeon, yeah. but. Yeah. You know, you can imagine. I, I absolutely love that. Um, the film of the Hammersmith Odeon concert, yeah. though. You know. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's magical. And one of the other things, uh, speaking of you know, being in Los Angeles, um, is the version, of, there was a bootleg from the Santa Monica Civic yeah. Center in 1972. Yeah. One of the greatest concerts yeah. from that Ziggy tour. I mean, yeah. I, that was my, what I had as yeah. a, Literally, as yeah. as a blueprint for what they did on that yeah. tour as a kid, because you know I wasn't there, you know. Right. And, but it was Absolutely. so brilliant, and you know, even when Bowie and Mick would Boy, do, Bowie, you're terrific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody got a piece of palm tree? I need a piece of palm tree. You yeah, it's so like that thing, and I'm like, what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like it was like I don't know whether somebody broke a string or yeah. something, but uh, I, I was talking about that show yesterday to somebody that was there, and I said I couldn't believe Santa Monica Civic Auditorium when I finally saw it. <laughs> you know, it was always mythical, right? Yeah, For me, it was the same. I mean, you know, and it turned <laughs> yeah. out to be. I mean, you know, I think I went to like some kind of uh, you know vintage clothing fair or something. Yeah, there, you know. I also being where we are right now, we're right close to Cherokee Studios, which was where David did Station to Station. Yeah, as well. So I feel like he is in He's these here. his 
you know, he's around this where we are right now. Yeah. He's kind of in this in this area too. Absolutely. And Station to Station was a great album. For an album of six songs, you talked about Stay. What an incredible thing when they did that live. I saw it in 76 yeah. as a you know a young guy. And I, in fact, the one that they ended up releasing, uh, a Nassau Coliseum, which was a bootleg for all, I was there as a kid, you know? And uh, I, I asked David once, I said, so David, man, you know, it was amazing when people saw that Salvador Dali, the, the, the movie with slashing the eyeballs, I said, the whole audience screamed. He goes, every time I heard the audience scream, I knew I had 10 minutes to get on stage. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly yeah. what he told me, which yeah. was pretty amazing. Yeah. But I love that. And, uh, you know, looking back on that record, considering what was going on in his life at the time, yeah. it's a brilliant album. We were on tour with him. Um, Glass Spider? Yeah, and uh, Rolling Stone, had, I think it was Rolling Stone, they just published like the top five David Bowie albums. They'd listed the top five Bowie albums. And and we were in the dressing room and and uh, eager. he said, yeah, no. I think Ziggy Stardust was number one. Yeah. And he said, no, no, he said, no. Station to Station's my best album. That's what his feeling yeah. was, yeah. But, but, you know, I mean, I, I think Ziggy Stardust is just perfect. It is a way. perfect I mean, they're both. I mean, they're both perfect. I mean, he's one of those rare artists where really, yeah. I mean, you know, for about 10 years there, he, he yeah. didn't make a bad record. I agree, like Hunky Dory and Diamond Dogs, even Diamond Dogs too. I, I, yeah, brilliant. I think from Space Oddity to, well, to Scary Monsters. Yeah, probably. that was a great run. Yeah, incredible. An incredible run right there. You know, and look, at, and it's, isn't it amazing too, how people now look back and embrace a song like Heroes and it's such a thing of people's hearts and culture. But at the time, it wasn't a very successful single, at least not in America. Amazing. You know, and it blows yeah. my mind because it's yeah. such a beautiful well, song. You know, look <laughs> at Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, it took right. Jeff Buckley to reinvent it, you know. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, it is. It's, it's just one of those songs that, I mean, you know, damn, when uh, when the Democrats run the election, that was a song I put on very loud. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's awesome. Now, you know, so tell me about the Glass Spider tour. I know you guys were on it. Mm. Susie, what were, I want to, I really want to know about the first time you met David. What was that experience? First time like? I met David was at a nightclub in London. It was early on. And, uh, you know, I, start, I was hanging out in this nightclub and I <laughs> knew the, the owner and, um, I was actually with my agent friend Rob, and the the owner comes and says, "Hey, come with me. You're gonna you're gonna want to see this." And sitting in the guy's office was David, uh, okay. with his friend Sabrina, and that was the first time I was introduced to him. And we had just uh, we had just recorded Fame, and I said, "Oh, we've just we just cut you know my band. We've just cut a version of Fame. You know, we're, we're working with Colin Thurston." Yeah, and he was like, "Oh, Colin, dear Colin," <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that was the first time, and 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 you know that was sort of you know, I think he was one of the first idols that I met, you know, and yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you know, and we spent quite a bit of time with him over the years. Um, you know, Nick got Nick spent a lot of time with him. I mean, I found him to be extraordinarily down to earth. And I, and, I, and I feel like that was almost like the legacy of the spaceman image in yeah. the 70s. Um, that, you know, he, he always, I mean, you know, I remember pulling up at some traffic lights on Sunset one evening and like this car, like pulling up right next to it and the window running down and going, Oi, Taylor, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, you know. That's great. But he was, yeah, I mean, he was... Uh, he was a he was a incredible incredible artist and and a great guy. Yeah, you know and um, it, you know it's amazing. You know, getting to know him for me was amazing and spending time with him because he was my, one of my idols as a kid. So over the years, it, it wasn't until '95 when we actually finally met. And I saw him at Elephant Man on Broadway, saw shows, and then uh, we became friendly and nice. were friendly. Yeah for many years, so I, I just, uh, you know, even when he was doing Heathen, he had had me over at his house and oh, wow. was playing the record and playing the other tracks and just asking me for my opinions on certain things. And I was in, with him in, in Tony Visconti and Looking Glass Studios. These amazing experiences that I had uh, with him, which were surreal, because I'm like, I'm hanging out with my idol. And, yeah, he, and, he yeah, and he's asking me what I think of yeah. something. So, you know, it's one of those things that you yeah. say to yourself, God, that's really beautiful. And he was, like you said, very down to earth and charming, mm. kind, yeah. and uh, incredibly clever. I just, uh, I love that about him. 
And those records will always be be so important. That's a great record. I mean, I yeah. like Heathen too. That's yeah. Like, that's a magical. Yeah. Magical. Record. Remind me because I want to talk to you about your experiences. But remind me later on when we have some time after this or another day to tell you tell you my Heathen story is pretty okay. incredible. You'll love it. But um, so tell me about some of those shows because the Glass Spider shows. Um, <laughs> for you, that was, that was. I mean, it wasn't the best. You know, neither of us. It was. It had been conceived at a time where we were coming off two of the biggest tours of the decade. David, David's tour had been the Serious Moonlight tour, which was and, great. Our, and ours had been the Seven and the Ragged Tiger tour. Right, third out. I mean, they were both massive, massive tours. So, the thought was that this was the bill of all time. Yeah. And uh, you know, but he put out a turkey. Yeah. Never let me down. Yeah. And Notorious didn't connect in the way that. Um, you know, the, the reflex had connected. You know? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it was for me, it, it was a learning process very much. Um, you know, we were going on. I mean, I, I always remember it was like, OK, there's there are double bills. But if you ain't closing, you're opening, you know, and that's kind of where I learned. You know, we'd go out on stage and we'd be like, where's the entire like like the first ten rows are missing, and they'd be they'd be like Pepsi contest winners meeting David while we were on, yeah, you know things like that. Um, but you know it was, and I <laughs> I remember the Glass Spider tour. Oh my God! I mean it was so OTT, yeah. and it had the longest intro. I don't know whether you remember that. Yeah, tour. <laughs> I mean yeah. it just went on and on before David finally appeared. Yeah. I feel like the house lights were down for like twenty minutes before yeah. he actually made the stage. But um, yeah, I mean, we were, you know, we were all just, you know, finding our way. But what a, what a fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic uh, experience to have in your resume, you know. Yeah. And now, uh, what about what about David doing "Hungry Like the Wolf"? Is uh, is that thing that people have said online? Is that real? I'm not aware of that. Yeah. So I'm wondering if somebody would just, put, you know, because you know how people will put things up online. Yeah. No, I think we'd know about that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm I know not, you would. I'm not aware of him ever doing a Duran song. I remember he was at the side of the stage at Radio City Music Hall, and we were, and we were doing "Get It On." We did "Bang a Gong," and we we're like, "Come on, now's the yeah. time!" But no, no, no. He, you know, I, I think he he was very fond of us. Yeah. Um. But you know, David. You know, but but we weren't. I don't think we were a band that you know that that David would have you know gotten on stage with. It just didn't. That wasn't you know that didn't make sense to him. But I think he was very fond of us. Yeah, and yeah, we, it definitely was. We, I mean, you know, the, and historically we know that, which is amazing. What was the last time that you had contact with him, John? Do you remember uh, the last experience you had? Because I know you know that sometimes. There were obviously so many different nights, but was in the. Uh, I mean, it might have been that. It might have been fa Fashion Rocks at Radio City. Yeah. And uh, it it could have been that night. Yeah. Um, and he was there with Arcade Fire. Yeah. And uh, that could have been the last time. We didn't, I didn't see him in the last few years. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I remember, you know, I spent quite a bit of time in New York in sort of like the year or two after he passed. And I would spend a lot of time at the Bowery, I was, you know, and I just felt him everywhere. Yeah, you it could was, do it. It was profound, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's the man for yeah. us, for, for, guys like us yeah he absolutely is and bowery bar is the first place that i met him we had dinner uh -huh. to, you know and I, it's me sitting across from him and Amon at, at the table uh -huh. they put us together and it was it was a magical evening it was just surreal for me and it, it incredible and i look back on all of it you know speaking of that you know one of the great things i saw you guys do and you know when it comes to people that love you and idolize you as a band and the way that you guys felt about david and his influence i thought it was really cool i love the way that when you guys played Broadway around the time of Astronaut, you walked out during the chauffeur by Deftones. Uh, remember they did the cover <laughs> of that? Yeah, which because the Deftones covered you guys, right. did you? and it's very tr yeah, yeah. it's like pretty very true to the yeah. version on Rio. Yeah. But uh, what did you think of when, when people would do tribute albums oh, to Duran Duran? Was great. it great? Wasn't it cool? Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're really excited to have Duran Duran on 
this show. It yeah. just it makes complete sense to me, and and I know it's going to be an incredible performance. The, the guy's excited about it all the way oh, around. Oh my god! I mean, firstly, we were excited to work with Mike. I mean, we only met Mike last year, and he played on uh, on our new album. Yeah. So when we got the email, uh, would you be interested in you know participating in this event and maybe do a version of Five Years yeah. with me? Yeah. You know, I think it was the fastest yes I think <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that we've ever had as a band. We were all like, yes. Yeah. You know, you never need, you had to think about it for a minute. There was no, no discussion, no, which no, is no. great. John, thank you for taking the time to hang out with me and talk to me before this show. It's always so, it's just great to see you. And it makes so much sense to me that yeah. uh, you guys are had to be a part of this, which yeah. I think is great. So thanks for taking the time to hang out. Thanks, man. Cheers. I appreciate it. You got it. John Taylor from Duran Duran. It's just for one day a Bowie celebration. Rolling Live presents a deep look into the life of David Bowie and his music with the people who love him most. Coming up in the next episode, I got to sit down with Slipknot and Stone Sour frontman Corey Taylor to talk about what David Bowie means to him 